Okie doke. Now with slightly better broadband. Okay, so that's the address to send me information to, ask a slides, whatever. And it's going to be judicial reviews is going to be something which we have to talk about this week. So I do hope uh, people have got the latest information and views uh, will be available at the end, but uh, let's see how that goes. Right, so quick sip of tea. And off we go. Um, how long have there been low traffic neighborhoods? This is a slide I nicked from last week because uh, the point is they've been going for ages and ages. Croydon Council has been referring to the Buchanan report in defense of their LTNs. Uh, something to remember, that's the thing that we, it's uh, got a long history and there are plenty of them already around. Right, uh, my tweet here got a lot of uh, positive responses. Um, disgraceful headline from BBC News. A van mounts the pavement, kills a baby. The baby in a pram is hit and killed, and it's referred to as a pram crash. So a lot of people got upset about that, including me. Don't forget the Active Travel Academy has a report on, out on how road crashes are um, reported in the media. This is uh, something I got from Councillor John Burke. In order for the UK to meet its targets, uh, it's clear that miles driven annually on our roads must fall by 34%. In London, that amounts to 7.2 billion miles. This cannot be achieved without low traffic neighborhoods, CPZs and road user pricing. I think he's right. Uh, this is what we need to do. This is where we're going. Uh, vehicle speed compliance statistics for Great Britain, July to September 2020, that came out uh, yesterday or today from Department for Transport. Um, here you can see what I talked about um, uh, last year in the summer, uh, national lockdown, fewer cars around, the ones that are left go faster, so you get these very high rates of compliance before lockdown fizzles out. And do note, this is the proportion of uh, uh, vehicles, a proportion of cars breaking speed limit in 30 mile an hour roads. Just turn my alarm clock off. Yeah, set to wake me up for now. Here we go. Uh, yeah, so uh, do go to that report and that's always useful for all cyclists always breaking the rules. Um, there's today's environment bill, a lot of campaigning uh, by Mums for Lungs and others to argue for World Health Organization targets for noxious emissions in today's environment bill. They've been using white buggies, symbolize dead children. Um, and here's some of the, uh, oh, here is my victim blaming for today. This is my old enemies, the London Road Safety Council, the Be Seen campaign. Uh, they have the usual staff, motorcycle cyclists should ensure they wear high vis. And this one I like, pedestrians should be aware of their invisibility, especially in the areas of poor street lining and wear high vis. So you have to wear high vis to walk around, otherwise you're a bad person, according to London Road Safety Council. Um, and one thing I particularly liked here the messages in our films are especially important for those who are new to winter walking and cycling. So what you've got is basic forms of getting around, which are seen as natural by everybody else in Northern Europe, are seen as sort of some special endeavor, some sort of uh, sporting activity, which you go out on winter walking. You just happen to be getting around in the most basic human way. And that is seen as a special enterprise by these characters. Uh, now, uh, this uh, tweet from uh, Cycling UK got a lot of um, responses on Twitter uh, saying that they'd messed up. Basically, what they were saying is Bob, not me, of course, owns the Fiat 500. 
And if he gets rid of uh, all his one to five mile journeys by car, he would save £104.26 p a year. And so a lot of piling on that, which they had to reply to saying, yeah, we also want it for health reasons and because you know you're less of an imposition on society and the planet. Uh, some people like Ian Walker saying would have actually been about 200 quid a year if you add everything up. And people like me saying, actually, this just shows how cheap motoring is. Because if you're only going to save one or 200 pounds a year, uh, which is like one or two coffees a week uh, from Starbucks by uh, uh, just not using your car for journeys below five miles, that's really not much of an incentive. And, you know, we need to say that the price of motoring should go up, in my view. Okay, here's some of the uh, things to read. Uh, Police and Crime Commissioner uh, elections. The Action Vision Zero manifesto. Uh, ourselves, Road Danger Reduction Forum, uh, were part of a webinar. Um, which involved the wonderful uh, uh, Chief Superintendent Andy Cox, uh, which was organized by Road Peace and Action Vision Zero. Uh, you can see the whole webinar if you go to the Road Peace website, but do look at the manifesto. This is for those of you outside London. Uh, as a uh, webinar run by Croydon Living Streets this week. Uh, national lockdown guidance, Cycling UK, as I said last week, have called for clarity on what your walking and cycling exercise can be. I don't think they've had a reply yet. Uh, campaign letter to the all-party parliamentary group, by the all-party parliamentary group on air pollution. That is uh, what I just mentioned, uh, the campaign run by Mums for Lungs. Uh, do have a look at that. Um, interesting tweet from Giulio Farini saying the litmus test, the litmus test in the LTN debate is whether you campaign for resident exemptions or not resident exemptions. Uh, if you do have resident exemptions, you will have increased convenience of short car journey for res residents with no or minimal traffic ev evaporation. So he's saying be careful about that. Uh, I understand that Hammersmith and Fulham Council are trying to get LTNs in and are willing to back down on the resident exemption issue in order to get them in. One to watch out for. Uh, there's a video of Joe Biden cycling there, which you'll want. Uh, there's uh, uh, Mr. Tranter and his colleagues have got together with the, to form the Cycling Marketing Board. Be reaching out to groups of women and other who, others who are not cycling so much now, uh, and uh, stand against SUV advertising. As I mentioned last week, SUVs have been selling an enormous amount with a load of calm dark side emissions. Uh, interesting piece by Caroline Russell, uh, one of the two green members of the London Assembly. This big opportunity to change transport in London for the better. Let's not waste it. Uh, here's the thing about carbon emissions falling across all sectors in 2020, apart from SUVs. That's from the International Energy Agency. Uh, at Travelwise Conference today, tomorrow, day after. Uh, that's the uh, petition against uh, the what used to be Freight Transport Association, now Logistics UK. Uh, very pleased to point out how they were campaigning against clean air zones, low emission zones. Uh, that's also another one. Uh, ask your MP to vote for a world leading environment law. That's again uh, lobbying, this time organised by Friends of the Earth. Now, do read this on the latest on the London cycling campaign on the High Court ruling about Bishopsgate and London street space, which I'll refer to shortly. Uh, Foundation for Integrated Transport call for proposals for campaigns against car dominance. They're a very good body and they do have some money. So if you're interested in doing uh, campaigns and uh, research and whatnot, do look at their website. 
and I mentioned this course, uh, which is an online course, Designing the City, see what your comments were. Diversity issues page, uh, nothing new there, except from this big report, pave the way. Uh, here's the uh, link. You should read that even if you don't have a special interest in disabilities. Everybody should have an interest in disabilities. And this is particularly relevant to low traffic neighborhoods. Uh, well, it is about low traffic neighborhoods. The impact of low traffic neighborhoods on disabled people and the future of accessible active travel. The delay slide is now the what's happening slide. And we still don't know about Active Travel England when it's going to happen or part six of the Road Traffic Act 2004. So on the ground in the UK, uh, Worcestershire, Bike Worcestershire got a, an FIO, FOI uh, request answered from Worcestershire Council. Uh, uh, the leadership has made it clear that the following red lines apply in terms of schemes which can be supported by the current administration. No loss of car space, parking spaces will be accepted. No loss of road space will be accepted, by which they mean they don't want reallocation of road space, which was specifically required by the government uh, from last May onwards. Liverpool, interesting uh, article by Liverpool cyclist on a low traffic neighborhood in Liverpool. And this, this was a 1930s cycle track, um, uh, which is researched by Carlton Reed uh, in Greater Manchester and Trafford. It's on, on Lostock Road, Ermston. These bollards are to be removed from the cycle track as they prevent residents from car parking. Uh, they, it, it, on the other side, uh, they're still there, uh, but, and they may have been ineffective, but it, it does show you what's happened and what is still happening when we're supposed to be moving ahead for active travel provision under the Active Travel Fund. Uh, and that's in Greater Manchester. Newcastle uh, temporary measures are going to be uh, beefed up uh, on the iconic Gray Street. Um, I think that's a bi-directional cycle lane, I'm not sure. Um, West Sussex, Upper Shoreham Road, they're saying that where the pop-up lane is being removed, they plan to install a permanent cycle lane. And they're saying they want to have seven and a half kilometers of new cycleways each year, but that's across the whole county. Uh, so you, you should be familiar with uh, what's happened on Upper Shoreham Road. Uh, in Leicester, the bike share scheme starts, and that's your first Bernie of the day. Oxfordshire, Scott Urban made a statement to council uh, on the LTN decisions. Three new LTNs were approved for Cowley and Oxford last week, and they'll be uh, implemented with emergency traffic regulation orders for uh, six months. Right, over to London. Okay, so this is it, Bishopsgate. Uh, Now, the story is that Bishopsgate was uh, amended with active travel measures, which prevent, prevented taxis from going into a bus lane. The London Taxi Drivers Association uh, sought a judicial review, said they couldn't go in there and pick up disabled people in wheelchairs uh, in their taxis. Now, uh, that plan and Bishopsgate in particular were deemed unlawful by the judge, Mrs. Justice whoever, uh, Irwin, I think, and uh, said that TfL and the Mayor of London need to reconsider the whole streetscape plan. That's all active travel pop-up measures that have gone in uh, since um, summer of 2020 and for it to be substantially amended. Uh, and TfL will appeal. 
So what I think you should read is there's that in Road CC. Do read LCC's blog post. And um, there's also a, a lot in the current local transport today. Uh, yeah, Mrs. Justice Lang, sorry, not Irwin. Uh, so that's uh, to do with issues to do with equality impact assessments not having been carried out supposedly or not being done supposedly. And it does have an effect on the foundations of the streetscape plan. However, LCC says it shouldn't affect current schemes that have gone in. So it, it, anyway, it, depending on whether TFL get a successful appeal in, or not, it's really hanging over all the active travel uh, measures in London, which is where most of them have been, uh, apparently, in terms of numbers, uh, certainly LTNs. Um, and it could have an impact on everybody in London. Uh, I'd like the views of people like Sun Monk and Mark Strong and others uh, on what you think the situation is. Lambeth, uh, TFL moves forward with plans to, to transform Streatham Hill. Looks quite radical, bi-directional. As you know, I'm not wild about bi-directionals, but there you go. Uh, in Wandsworth, um, yeah, from uh, Sutton, Sutton Council had a report saying uh, that Wandsworth is the only borough to formally withdraw draw all the uh, LTN schemes. Um, and at least 21 boroughs have put them in. Uh, I think uh, they could have put in Hounslow and Corporation of London and Lewisham, so that's about 24, um, with Hillingdon, Havering, Richmond, Bexley, Kensington, Chelsea, and Bromley um, not having done anything. Uh, now, better streets for RBKC, who are a very good campaigning group, been fighting for the uh, lanes on Kensington uh, High Street to go back in. Um, if you're in London, get involved with them. They're very, uh, very committed, very good group. Uh, that's better streets for RBKC. Uh, Camden, uh, Endell Street, you can't quite see, Endell Street, Gower Street, Homan, stuff is going on. Uh, Linus Reese has been pointing out that there's some problems. Uh, so have uh, Camden Cycling Campaign have been pointing about issues. David Arditi said they're fundamental to the whole uh, of what they were trying to do in the first place. Uh, anyway, we'll see how that develops. Uh, local people uh, being involved with uh, discussions with Camden Council on that. Uh, this is worrying. Camden Council has scrapped the Haverstock Hill uh, cycle lanes order. Um, that seems to have been as a consequence of the Bishopsgate uh, decision, uh, Mrs. Justice Lang's decision. We'll see what happens there as well. Uh, okay, this is Newham, Forest Gate, low traffic neighbourhood. Uh, cameras go in also on neighbouring road where motor traffic had gone up after LTNs went in. Uh, there's the cameras. So the cameras going in uh, in order to deal with some displacement of motor traffic due to the LTN going in. And here's your special Bernie. That's Bernie in Copenhagen in a cargo bike. That's very nice. It's almost as good as Bernie in Amsterdam. There he is getting a backy in Amsterdam. I think that's the best Bernie. Um, in terms of advertising and stuff, do go to willcycleblogspot.com. Uh, some of you will know Will Cycle will be more like bike from Twitter. He's done loads of graphics for t-shirts and mugs, and a lot of them are very, very good. Um, kind of a bit raunchy, some of them, but there you go. So that's that. 
Any comments? Any points of order for Bob? Or oh, yeah, I'll, I will actually learn to look at the hands going up as well when anybody wants to do that, or just come in. Yeah, I'd... my my favourite Bernie was the the Totoro one. I have to say, well, run it. But that <laughs> that's just to warm us up for what people want to say about the court case. Yes, very nice. Everybody's being silent. This is good. Uh, I would like. I mean, I would like comments from other people about the court case. I've seen various comments uh from people who know uh lawyers who do a lot of work on jr's and they've been saying that her judgment is dubious and it, it is hopefully going to be overturned on appeal but i don't know about time scales i don't know how things can be changed um it's you know i it, it's absolutely critical uh and uh you know, even if you're just scaring people off uh, from doing what needs to be done, um, that's going to be of interest. So anybody who knows about uh, lawyers' involvement in planning and stuff, please do give me your takes. I'll, I'll, I'll just say one thing before I bring someone in. Uh, my, my personal take, having been through a few of these, when I was at TFL and Camden and the like, and with the Mini Hollands, is... is yeah, really, like that is it attacks the consultation and the process of that. So that's that's the ruling, and everything on on top of that that the judge said uh, for me is a was quite an overreach. <laughs> they want to do a big statement, but really, the, it's like yeah, he didn't consult properly. All right, we'll consult properly then. That's really the the way I take it from my engineers had on, and everything else that the judge said. It has ramifications, and people will quote it, but that's just your opinion, dude. That's not the law. Um, I'll bring in um, Dr. Graham Cooper now, who was good from last week. Go on, Graham. Go on, Graham, I can see you. Sorry, I've struggled on, on muting now. I'm on a tab now. It's not, uh, not easy to operate. Um, yeah, the, um, I agree with what you just said about the, the ruling. I read the whole thing through, and it takes a long time, but it's worth reading. I'm not a lawyer, but it is a very clear um, statement. And the actual rulings themselves, I think, are very specific. They're about um, the, the alleged failure of TfL to um, recognise the special status of London hackney cabs in, um, in law um, and things that relate to that. Uh, there were a lot of other things that, uh, that were said almost as asides, which, which I don't think form part of the ruling. But the thing that, that is of concern is that First, it's being reported quite widely as being much more far reaching than it is. Um, and that is causing, I think, councils to believe that there are things happening that, that really aren't. I was at a, um, a consultation meeting on a low traffic neighborhood uh, last night. And one of the councils actually stated that this is, this is uh, going to lead to all of these cycle lanes being ripped out everywhere across the country and everything. And I actually had to correct the councillor on that. And this is a councillor who is actually a member of the cabinet. And so this sort of message is getting into council cabinets, I think, and we need to, uh, to be concerned about that. Thanks for that, Graham. Yeah, very similar to my take, uh, I have to say. Um, uh, Roger Geffen, did you want to come in? I'm going to do Roger, then then Simon, then Luke. Good, thanks, yes. I mean, uh, absolutely echo what Graham's just said. Um, meanwhile, as as I think you'll be aware, we, um, we're seeking legal advice on um, other other cases. I think the, the, the really important point is, as as you said, Bob, that Judicial reviews are about the process by which a decision is taken, not the outcome of that decision. Um, the important point is that um, the arguments that won were all related to taxis, and they covered things like the, 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 the fact that taxis are heavily used by people with uh, disabilities as a form of public transport, and therefore by failing to consider that, um, TfL had breached its, its public sector equality duty by not, not considering an, an issue relating to uh, a group with what are known in law as protected characteristics, such as age, um, 
sex, sexuality, and so on. Those are all protected characteristics. And, you, and decision makers have to give due consideration to um, the effects of decisions on people with protected characteristics. That's all protected characteristics, not just disability. So equality issues can weigh on both sides of a decision on whether to introduce or remove uh, cycle lanes, low traffic neighborhoods, and so on. Um, this is, and when Better Streets for Kensington Chelsea wrote their uh, letter for action to Kensington Ch uh, Council, which prompted them to reconsider their decision, one of the really powerful arguments was that Kensington Chelsea hadn't con considered the implications for children cycling to school. And that too is a factor in, in, um, in the old Shoreham Road scheme, the, the, the West Sussex scheme. So we will be looking to challenge that effectively to, to um, remind local authorities that equalities considerations weigh on both sides of the argument. It's absolutely right in law that decision makers need to weigh up all aspects of equality, um, but it doesn't mean that schemes are that street space and similar schemes are right or wrong. It just means you need to take account of all of the decisions. And a decision which fails to take account of the effects on children is as un is likely to be un ruled unlawful as one that fails to take account of the impacts on people with disabilities. They can weigh on either side of the argument. I mean, that's exactly why I think you're. Um, we're rock, you, you're, you're, uh, Graham and, and others are right. We, we need not only to TFL to succeed, whether partly or wholly in, in overturning the, the, the street shapes decision, we need some other decisions as well, just to you know, correct mm -hmm. the perception uh, that has been created by this, by this decision. Excellent. Thank you. I'll bring in Simon now. Yeah, I mean, I think I think what Brian has said and what Roger has said, I totally agree with, you know, this is ultimately going to be decided on procedural issues. Has procedure been followed properly, etc. Um, and there is, you know, uh, it would be very, very surprising indeed if there was not the opportunity for TfL um, uh, to just redo some of their procedures if it is eventually found out that the found that they are that they've acted unlawfully or, you know, uh, against the, the legislation um, so they can redo traffic orders they can redo their guidance they can reissue stuff etc um, to to patch any legal holes that are left um, i think the point that i was going to make really on top of all that is this exposes to my my mind the long kind of bubbling issue about taxis both as taxis as you know the way that tfl and successive deputy mayors and other people have kind of talked about them as if they are public transport um and i think it's high time we started having a conversation about whether taxis are public transport in my view any form of transport that, that is incredibly expensive and largely used by single occupants is not what i would call public transport and it's about time we actually started saying they're not public transport more than that they're not massively used by disabled people so let's be really clear about who needs them when and and i think all of this to me speaks to the need for some kind of modified blue badge scheme that enables disabled people who are reliant on motor vehicles to get around and have enhanced access to places but doesn't allow taxis to just stomp their way through every bus gate in the whole of London. You know, because the vast bulk of, of, of taxi passengers aren't disabled and actually could do their journeys by other modes and should do their journeys by other modes. So there's a real issue here about who has access, where, why and how. And, and we have to be, as a, again, I think Roger said, taxi access to every bus lane would have impacts for lots of people with lots of protected characteristics. So there is always this issue to be struck about how we can enable access without disenabling other other access. That's me. Oh, there was some juicy bits in that statement there, Simon. There's almost like a topics for like whole sessions there. The role of taxis in public transport there. The changing of blue badges are, uh, uh, yeah, I think we've got to give these things a proper deep dive uh, sometime. And uh, um, thanks for having such a common rich thing. Uh, Luke, I'll bring you in now. I think you had your hand up. Yeah, yeah. I, I think one of the core things that people tend to forget about the court case is that it, it tackled TFL street space on, yeah, a bit of a weird procedural issue, I would say. But the core underlying statutory demand for local authorities what the dft has issued remains unchallenged and i think people tend to forget that they're, they're looking at the street space plan and what tfl is doing but 
the DFT has given statutory guidance to all of the local authorities to reallocate road space and to enable walking and cycling and to do a whole host of pandemic related responses. That is not in question. It's really what TFL has done with the guidance following from that, but the core underlying thing, the, the, the statutory powers that local authorities have, that remains unchallenged. So I think there's a lot of people now kind of scared, like, oh, this is the first big court case that is currently lost, depending if TFL can do their appeal or not. But the underlying powers, the statutory powers that change, that is not reversed. So that I think is just really important to remember as well. Yeah, I'll let Bob come in. I could say a thing or two about that statement, Luke, as well. Go on, Bob. Uh, yeah, on taxis, I remember when I started in transport planning about 35 years ago, uh, I was told by, and this was before Uber and everything, um, someone said, oh, don't get involved in the taxi issue. It's, it's a bear pit. Everybody's fighting each other. It's really heavy. And the cabbies do have a tendency to be fighting a kind of culture war against active travel, which is... You know, I would say not in their own best interest, but it does happen a lot and, um, you know, it will have to be dealt with. Something else that LCC said on the consultation issue, um, that what street space uh, is relating to is actually to the Mayor of London's transport strategy, which was extremely heavily consulted on. I mean, there were loads of different organizations. Everybody's been heavily involved. So lots of consultation has happened. Similarly with local authorities in London who have in their various documents and in their manifestos, lots of stuff about putting in cycle lanes, etc. So a lot of consultation has already taken place. So uh, anyway, watch this space. And I'm glad that uh, LCC and uh, Cycling UK are on are on the case uh, with regard to the whole JR process, um, which will be going on in various specific localities uh, as, as over the next few months. But do keep us informed, particularly over timescales, people. Just say a couple of things before we shift on, because I'm I'm chairing and I give myself that that ability. Just when it comes to taxes, we have worked positively with taxis in the past uh, particularly in the active travel community it has happened and i'm gonna um make you all remember when lcc did the uh the cleaner taxi engine kind of supported campaign thing oh i'll try and remember what it is but that's one for time to look at but we only remember how well they worked together on that one and, and i'm hoping those happy days can return again and, and i'll just respond to luke on the dft i don't work for dft i'm just a consultant but but my view um is, it, is the information they've given out was kind of related to the fund and what they wanted people to do. It wasn't like a, a direct order. It was like, you have to meaningfully reallocate road space to get this money for this particular aspect of it. It wasn't like the whole, we've changed all our policy. Lord, I, I wish it was. And you could take it that way that the statements are coming down that way, but I don't think um, DFT would ever be in a position that they gave an instruction. It's all been interpreted by the local authorities. So they're kind of a little bit covered because um, a few people have said that to me, but the government told them to. The government gave the rules of the game, but like it's up to the actual highway authority to play with them is, is my take on that. You were grumbly faces there, but I felt that was important to say. All right, I'll move on. Uh, Sally, uh, are you there? Yeah. Lee, you know, let's, uh, come back to it. Sally, yeah, the floor's yours. Thank you. Right, I'm going to share my screen. Um, I'm actually going to touch on something that, that, that Bob um talked about which is this article uh that was in the bbc just i think it was just yesterday which i'd actually missed and, and i'm bringing it up because somebody got in touch with me to say if it was mentioned on ideas with beers could i say something about rachel and and her baby louis um he know he knows rachel um and he said that he'd seen it on Twitter and that his outrage at language on a theoretical level, I can understand, but it's a person and a family. And so he asked me if I would, if it did come up, um, and actually I thought I would anyway, even if it didn't, if I would say something about that. Um, and I think that, you know, I think most of us read these stories and they're really shocking and they're upsetting. And it's shocking and upsetting, whoever it is, but when we read about children, we read about babies, um, it, it's all the more shocking and upsetting. So um, 
I thought it was, you know, he was really, he's right. We should all, we have to be really careful when, when we are passing on the, sharing these stories, we have to be careful about how we're talking about them. And just to remember that, you know, Rachel does have, you know, family and friends who, who'll be reading what other people say about, about her and about her baby. And, um, you know, she was on maternity leave and, and, you know, what, a, what a just, devastatingly shockingly awful thing to happen so um i just thought it was really important to to say this is this is some people's lives who've just been devastated she's in hospital still i don't know how she is um but that when you know when we're sharing these stories just to be really mindful that that you know of the kind of language that we're using and and you know when you see these and you're shocked and upset yes the way that they are communicated to the public isn't good and should change but but also other things need to change too. What else can you do um, to share that story with, you know, write to your MP, which I can say every week and say, these things shouldn't be happening. Why are these things happening? Um, what, what, you know, can you ask a question about whatever it is, um, you know, investment in, in pavements, investment in what, what are the things that you can do to ask for, for to support changes, to make, make streets safer for people, whatever it is. So um, that's all I wanted to share. I'll just stop sharing. Um, I think it's, it, you know, changing the, how, changing the guidance for, for the press to, to talk about these things is, is really important. But we, we're also communicating about these, these stories. And I think we, we should really just be really think if that, this was me and I was before you press send, if this was my family, how, how would I feel? Um, and, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Yeah, brilliantly said, Sally. You're absolutely bang on. I've got two young kids myself, and uh, twice over lockdown, I had cars zooming down footways that to scream and drag them out of the way. So it does hit home, and you know we're all we're all feeling for that family there. So thanks for getting us back on point. That's uh, that's really great. Um, has anybody got any questions or, or comments or things you want to say after that, Sally, or should we move on? I can't see any hands, but that's brilliant as ever. Um, Graham, I'm going to bring Graham in now. Um, Graham Smith, um, design legend. I'm going to try and work your PowerPoint slides now. Oh, yeah. Graham, are you there? Graham. <laughs> I mean, he's one of Bob's alarm. I am, I am, I am. <laughs> hey, <laughs> good to see you. Are you going to show the slides or do you want me to share? Why don't you have a go, and then I've got it lined up if we need. I can't promise I'll be any quicker than you, but I'll, uh, I'm on standby. What do I do? Oh, share screen, I see. Oh, yeah, hit that big green button. Bob could probably talk you through the process now. <laughs> there we go. Am I anywhere near? Yeah, you're looking good. You've got the slides up. Is it the slide or is it the um, the comment? Oh yeah, the, yeah. Start the slideshow. I'm losing uh, the will to live. It happens. Go to slideshow, uh, Graham. There, there we go. go. He's got it. Anyway. You're off, Graham. Look forward to this one. Right. Uh, this is a brief piece. In Oxfordshire, uh, a new streets guidance has just been, or being, uh, consulted upon. Um, and it's remarkably difficult to, um, to excite people about a county council residential street design guidance. Um, most lose the, the will to live very quickly, but um, it seems to me that uh, it affects walking and cycling and um, uh, enormously. And even though it's regarded as being something for um, residential, for new residential developments, it's actually a, a pretty tight mirror on the, the soul of the highways department. Uh, to say nothing of uh, developers who know that influence enormously the uh, the process. Um, a tiny bit of history in 97, DB32 comes out. And one of the concerns of DB32, a major concern, and I 
knew um, John Noble a tiny bit, one of the authors, um, is this notion that they want a nuisance-free environment and therefore there should be roads for going and, uh, and there could be roads for, <coughs> excuse me, for being places. This comes out of the Buchanan Report. When Manifold Streets comes out, it has this, which I'm not quite sure whether many highway authorities have read it, but um, it makes the point that, um, uh, that the use of the, uh, of the old guidance uh, has led to development patterns where busy distributor roads link relatively small cell cells of housing. This has been exacerbated, of course, by the complete lack of planning for new development, meaning that um, any farmer with a spare field can uh, stick it in for planning. And so it's by definition going to be a small cell that's relatively uh, isolated. And such layouts aren't, aren't conducive to anything but shortest trips on foot or by bike. And there are many advantages in extending the use of multifunctional streets in urban areas to busier routes. Um, I was enormously excited <laughs> in the early 2000s when this was being discussed and when it came out. Um, Oxfordshire County Council on the right hand side shows uh, an, Im an image from its 2003 and then the renewed in 2015 residential roads design guidance, almost completely blind to manual for streets, um, whereby it has a local centre effectively isolated from housing areas. Um, and obviously some sites have uh, shops or depending on the site, uh, supermarkets within them, but they're still relatively isolated. And the notion of um, shops growing or even dying um, on, on busy streets is, is completely uh, lacking in this kind of arrangement. Uh, and you can't usually get small shops in, um, in these kinds of isolated local centre. The, the road design guide, the, the county road design guide, has a few pages of heartfelt explanations of all the things that, um, that they want to happen. And then instead of in the want to happen bit, instead of saying we want more cycling, more walking, and therefore we will have X or Y or Z, they don't say any of that. They just say, we want more walking and cycling. And then they say, this is gonna be illustrated in a demonstration master plan on the right hand side. And the demonstration master plan has got a number of characteristics that are interesting or not. Um, the main primary route is effectively a distributor road that um, has different characteristics. So that's in highway highways terms, that's kind of quite enormously, uh, enormously changed. You can, you can just about read the, the different colors here and then here they're red and here's orange and here's red and then a darker red and so on. Um, but, but that route, does it look like a bus route? Does it look like a cycle route? It looks extremely devious. One of the things in Manifold Streets uh, it talks at some length about uh, an analyzing the site and picking out things that matter, that should or shouldn't be connected or, or whatever. Um, this county guide does none of that. It just says this is a real site, but it doesn't tell you where. So I presume these things on the right hand side are, are a real place, but you can't quite grasp whether this is a small town, a small a village, or the edge of a large town, and therefore you can't there are lots of things that you can't say. There's a railway line here that's not mentioned in the uh, in the guidance. You, up on the top right, there's a main railway line as well. So presumably in the town, to the right hand side, there's a, a railway line. But this lazy S curling all over um, is a trope that's been in highway engineering for for a long time. The notion of having an interesting curvy path. I think it's um, it it it. it it's been it's been claimed to be to to be related to a was it a cemetery in New Jersey, in the states where a, a new uh, carriage roads were kind of winding, and then uh, I can't remember whether Birkenhead comes before or after that. Anyway, this trope of making an interesting place to drive has been around for a long time. What it means is it makes walking and cycling more difficult, um, and probably bus routes too. Um, next, oh, I'm doing it. The 
So the primary street is very unlike a distributor road in, in some ways. It has um, uh, a cycle lane all the way through it, although it has some rather odd kinks, if you look at the cycle lane. Um, and it has some trees that are adoptable, not all of them, but some of them. One of the points I want to make um, here is that there are various little vignette perspectives in the, in the guide. And this is a vignette of the primary street. Um, for my sins, I did spend some years making perspective drawings back in the day before computers <laughs> were in. And this cannot be a perspective drawing of any part of the primary street. It's a lie. Uh, it's a lie not only because it has no cycle provision on it, but it's also much more enclosed. Um, it's enclosed visually in the distance, although there are kinks in the, uh, in the primary street, making that not implausible. And so one of the points to pick up, I guess, is, is don't be misled by the little images and uh, design guides since the Essex design guides and even the Cheshire design guide, I think, of the 70s um, had this exact same problem showing pictures of, of containment that were massively bigger or massively smaller than the possible um, uh, geometrical um, arrangement of streets could be. And, and here I focus in on a couple of things that do interest me in this and don't, don't annoy me so much. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen, look at the, um, see the colors on the, of the road changing from brown to maroon to pink to orange as it goes through. So this on the left hand side is a village shared space according to the legend. And on the right hand side, a town center space, according to the legend. Quite interesting to actually have major shared spaces. And the guide has pictures of Poynton in it, which I still like. Um, and, um, but I'm also in a, a local um, school streets group. Um, and both of these town centers have schools right at the busiest point, which, um, which might be. <coughs> improve because they're um, shared spaces or might be made worse because they're the busiest part of the junction. And I'll go to the next one. I think this is the last slide uh, now. Um, and a comment from uh, a dear friend, former colleague of mine, Sue McGlynn. Uh, she comments on the page about tertiary edges, fringes and private drives. As elsewhere, private drives are being sanctioned. This really makes my blood boil. You don't need turning heads in a connected layout and won't achieve the switch to more sustainable modes of travel without joining routes up. Private drives are designed to deter not just cars, but also cycles and pedestrians. And when you focus in on the drawing, you can see lots of these dark gray, <coughs> dark gray um, tertiary peripheral streets that are in private ownership. And here even is and this white dotted line at the bottom isn't in the um, uh, legend, but presumably it's a, a footpath or a connection. Um, but none of these, but all of these could carry problems into the future, depending on who the people are who are living uh, alongside them. Um, you can imagine it could be closed off. I think there is one more slide. Oh, the last, the last slide. You might be interested that this is on page 45 under the section called refuse collection where it's actually saying uh, we are going to carry on using big refuse trucks in Oxfordshire so get real but it actually this is the page where the county fully endorses manual for streets and manual for streets too isn't that wonderful page 45 of a 51 page document under refuse collection we've got full adoption so my Message. I mean, this is a very brief uh, <coughs> critique of uh, our county <coughs> guide. Do you know your county guide? Um, since much of the country isn't London and, uh, and every county will have a guide and some of them adopt manual streets, but very few do. The North <coughs> Northamptonshire one does, the Nottinghamshire one that was passed last week or something doesn't. <coughs> I watched councillors talking about how wonderful cul-de-sacs were and, uh, and that it would be good to have more cul-de-sacs because then people who wanted to walk could get more 
healthy by um, walking further. So they're enormously important. Um, they contain the seeds of devastation. End of talk. Thanks. <laughs> Brilliant, Graham. Brilliant. Do you want to stop sharing before we get into some comments? I mean, you, you absolutely bang on. If we don't get these things right, then we're, you, know, you come along as uh, a street designer like myself and go, oh my God, we have to change all of this. And and there's so many new developments I see and plans that are, I was like, oh, they want to put this, put up with this in 1950. <laughs> it's like un unbelievable. Some of the stuff that's happening near me over Luton Way and Milton Keynes is beggar's belief. Um, so I, I'm, I'm glad you're picking up on it. It's a real hot one. And we, you know, we had Holmes, Holmes England on the other week talking about their plans for it. Yeah. And, and we can keep saying all the good things, but someone has to make it happen. So maybe this is like a, uh, Design England or whatever they're called, we're, we're getting our, our own quango. So I wanted to ask you about that. Do you think it's going to be like a, the new body? Will they sort it all out? Or what do you think? You mean the thing that Amy Amy Burbridge is, is running? Uh, yeah, no, no there's, isn't there a new body to look after? Like a, kind of like, um, what were they called? Oh, I've forgotten the name of them now. Um, it was being called Design England for a while, but I think it's called something different now. But there is a new, well, maybe that's not out yet, and I've outed something that's like a. I, I feel I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's not. I, there was some, wasn't there some mention? <coughs> mention of it in the Building Better, Building Beautiful uh, texts about that this is going to happen, but I haven't seen it happen yet. Yeah, well, I think that, I think uh, things are happening on that front. Maybe like uh, I've asked Robert Huxford to come in, and I'm sure he'll uh, he'll know all about that, and. Um, and Esther at Urban Design London has been talking about. So I think that, you know, potentially we will get some kind of planning body that will look at after things and, and stop this stuff happening. Because uh, when I started working in Manchester, I was like, OK, well, who does the transport observations, uh, like, from a strategic level? They're like, the what? I was going, well, if I was in London, I could talk about the building that does that, <laughs> all the people in it. I mean, very much, I couldn't find, find the person uh, that did it for the entire region and I was like ah that's why the footways look like that that's uh I won't get anywhere just just to pick on Greater Manchester for a minute and um, has anybody got a, a question or, or comment for for Graham while we're here I'll make one go on then Ruth uh so where my partner lives in Vladingen which is a small town west of Rotterdam uh, all the streets they live in are one way. They are parked, lined with cars on both sides um, and very narrow and very almost no drives at all. But the rubbish collection is at the ends of the streets and they have these extraordinary things where they've sunk them down and the lorry comes along and they lift it out and it opens into the lorry. Um, but of course they planned for that, they built for that, whereas my borough, although we have excellent recycling, They've just had new lorries only three years ago, so they couldn't possibly change it for a different system. So, you know, that's the way they operate there. Um, and the rubbish garden rubbish lorries are much, much smaller and can fit down these streets and then tip the garden rubbish in. I, 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 I think that's really interesting. I was going, I was taking students to, um, to look at the, in Amsterdam, to look at the Eastern Islands development, which was exciting for architecture and exciting for urban design, I don't know if you know it, um, and on the Eastern Islands, Oselak Island, and um, there are so many wonderful things uh, there for urban design and transport. But one of the things that I noticed one year after they'd built, they'd started building the, the huge um, apartment blocks that they had to stick in because they had to achieve 100 dwellings per hectare, according to the town hall, and uh, they had to put in apartment blocks. And then we, we arrived there one year and there were these huge um, concrete monoliths lying around the place, three metres high, two and a half metres high and uh, one and a half metres square. And I suddenly realised that even though this development was planned and approved and three quarters of the way through building, they had decided or someone had decided that, um, uh, that, um, that paladins on the street wasn't a good thing. And so they're retrofitting on a development that was nearly finished, um, uh, cassette uh, refuse. And there's loads of, and I think nearly everywhere in the Netherlands now has cassette refuse. I've got lots of pictures of it. 
in different towns, uh, quite a bit in Germany, um, in, in lots of countries, even quite a bit around England. Um, but it, it doesn't seem to get the news that it should. Um, uh, I, I, I think it could st still be retrofitted. And of course, you only need one operator operating a refuse truck that does cassette refuse. Um, it can steer the refuse cassette out of, you know, within millimeters of parked cars nearby. Um, it's a very odd, I mean, I, I'm cl completely with you. I think we should have refuse uh, everywhere that's done, done like that. I mean, I live in a Victorian street. We've got a brown bin, a blue bin, uh, uh, a green bin for general refuse and a little bin for, uh, for food collection. It's a fantastically efficient service, I have to say. No mm. complaints about it. God, it doesn't have to fill up the footpaths when it's collection day. But the, and the other thing, sorry, uh, this is loud, Brian, was um, furniture and pallet delivery for someone rebuilding their garden. The lorry stopped at the junction where there was space. And then it had, like you see in a factory, mm -hmm. a little thing on those metal things, which dropped down and pootled along the road, dropped off the pallets, came back, collected some more, went back. Um, they seem to not care when the road is blocked. They don't get angry like they do here, and it's just part of the course. And there's very little car movement during the day anyway. Let's let's move there, Ruth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I will say Eddington in Kane, which is quite a good example of a decent refuge uh, collection in that Dutch style. I went there taking pictures of it because uh, <laughs> I was born as Graham when it comes to, to refuge in there. <laughs> uh, uh, David Harrison, I'll bring you in next. Uh, you got a question, comment? Oh, thanks. Graham, I, I... I live on the border of Islington and Hackney, and now we have our low traffic neighbourhoods. Um, everything seems perfect. It's almost like living in paradise. Um, four storey houses, many of them high density. Um, is it really impossible to reproduce in new developments? Can we not learn from them? I suppose the one thing to think about maybe is, is parking on the street, which rather spoils it. But can we not have something like Freiburg where the Parking is some distance away from the homes for most of the time. Given that the car I'm looking out on now, my neighbour's car probably hasn't been moved for two months. Yeah, well, I don't think my hear? car's moved much since March. Um, and uh, it's probably depreciated another few thousand pounds in that time. The, 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 the fact is, and we know it well, that if you, if you want to... Uh, have more active active travel <clears throat> and if you want to reduce car use then although it doesn't feel much like it you need to have a kind of Islington Hackney like morphology you need to have connected streets with main streets that traffic goes along got to help us if we breathe in the fumes um, and <clears throat> I mean uh, I don't well I'd be nice I'd be interested to know if there are any modern studies but there was a study done for uh, CNU um, in the 90s by uh, Chalman, an engineer in the in the USA, who was doing a study for a CNU development, and at the same time he was doing an analysis of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and he had loads of traffic data, and he thought this has round about the same kind of mix of housing and other uses in it compared to a normal uh, subdivision, a kind of zone subdivision. Uh, that he was used to working with traffic generation diagrams, um, and so they 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 analysed the the data, and he came to the conclusion, which, if I remember right, from the top of my head, is that um, half the expected number of car journeys could be observed in a connected up. Admittedly, it was a an old area of Portsmouth, um, and in the rush hour, a fifth to a sixth of the amount of traffic was observed. So we know that if you have a traditional form, you don't need to use a car anywhere near enough. Um, do we know any other research about reducing the need to use a car? It doesn't seem to get into street design documents. I'd, I'd do a shout out to Steve Mealy's website. It's also like uh, David mentioned Freiburg. He's got a really good review on, on Freiburg. He's the, the, you know, the king of filtered permeability, the guy who coined the phrase and it's all about car free streets. So um, shout out to Steve. Must try and get him on one week here. I wonder if we can get Steve on. Wow. Definitely worth reading his books as well. Be around 
of that one. Oh, I can see that there is another hand up. Uh, Dave, did you want to come in? Or is that, is that like a hand that's been left there from a previous time? Dave Holiday? Or it's been there all the time. Has it? <laughs> no. Just waving at us. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it was, yeah. and it was actually a comment on an earlier piece um, with um, taxis and so forth and um, we were talking about. So uh, I, I put it in the chat instead. All right, good man. Oh, your sound's gone again on us, Dave. What, one of these days. You, you nailed it the other week. Um, tell you what we'll do. We'll, we'll move on to the last talk and uh, I'll probably uh, mute that noise. Um, I'll... I'll just show a bit of crossings now. I haven't spoken for ages of this one. I've just turned up to see who else has talked, but uh, I thought I'd show crossings because uh, Laura Laker did a really good um, article on this and I thought it was great and I wanted people to use it. I thought it'd be nice to, to deep dive that a little bit. But first, to segue over from um, Graham's bit, I'm gonna show this. Let's show the end. Slide show from the beginning. I was going to do a top 10, but then I thought I've got to mention another two. It'll kind of kill me. So we are going to do like um, a Google Street tour that I tried to make happen before, but I just want to show a, a little bit about Results some of the things that were... Oh, come in. Um, just some of the things that were too boring for Laura to show in the actual article. But like, uh, I wanted people to know about it anyway. Um, so yeah, I, I wanted to go back about cycling priority signalized junctions. What are they called and where do they start? And, and from my archives behind me, the, the kind of earliest drawing I could get hold of. And I, I love this. And a big thanks to Bill Mount for giving me a copy of this. Give way a Friends of the Earth document from, from 1974, which some people on the, on the call might remember. Yeah, I was three at the time, so it was a little bit early for me to, <laughs> to really get into it. But I do love this picture, a cycle priority route, a pedestrian cycle, using traffic lights, cycle-only traffic lights in the UK in 1974. Can anybody beat that for a historically early mention? And then I like a... Uh, I'm a huge fan of this book as well and the, the kind of longer version as well and Mike Hudson's bicycle planning book uh, everybody should have a copy of this one knocking around but there's also quite a similar drawing in there note the use of the elephant footprints oh it's very exciting only uh what was it six years ago we finally got them <laughs> approved okay uh, so just uh, going through the ages um got to do a shout out for this my favorite um video on on YouTube for the the geeks really I'm, I'm going deep deep geek now for the next 20 minutes so prepare yourself but definitely worth having a look at that video of the glc cycle unit i mean uh, lots of those people are heroes of mine they really pushed the envelope and got a lot of new stuff through and and i spent the first half of my career figuring out what they were doing and the second half just trying to do more of it so uh trying to get you to catch up there but it's really interesting to to watch that video from 84 and I, and I mentioned it because the first one in my top 12 is shown in that video so it lets me know that there was a, a parallel crossing on Euston Road in 1984 that the GLC, GLC cycle unit did so uh, uh, fantastic. Uh, moving on, um, 1997 now after the national cycling strategy came out we had like a, the first use of like a parallel crossing in an official DFT document uh, cycle friendly infrastructure which I've got a copy behind because uh, lots of people argue with me about these things well they're not really crossings Brian it's a junction and and you'll see in the latest one that they got no we, we have to call it something a little bit weird that nobody understands there's the Department for Transport calling it a parallel crossing I still call it that <laughs> because I started reading these things there um, go through to the 1998 uh, LCN design manual what I like to call LCDS1 but like a now there, we'll get to that other one in there. And there's this reference of a parallel cycle and pedestrian crossing. And, and that's that's really uh, at the point where we started putting lots in in London. And, and I'm doing this as much for the rest of the country because it seems London, we've been doing them forever. And I go and mention these things around the rest of the country where we go, what are they? You can't do that. That's not a junction. And 
and and it's a little bit confusing the way it's mentioned in LTN 120 and I hope Phil Jones doesn't mind me saying that. <laughs> anyway, they're in there, there's a picture. Um, so 2005, we're still going on parallel cycle and pedestrian crossings in London. There's the LCDS 2005, moving on. 2008, they're in there, still called the parallel crossing in 2008 by the Department for Transport, it's there. What's different about it, it's a crossing, but the, the kind of key bit, you can look at the picture there on the right, and no zigzags. That's fundamentally what it's come down to, and, and we'll come back to zigzags and control zones um, at the end <laughs> of this short bit, this intro. Uh, 2014 LCDS, that, yeah, that, this is my fault. This is what I've always called them. And it's really like a, a bad remembered version. That, but I felt it was clearer to call them a, a parallel signal control crossing. That makes sense to me. So that's what it was called in 2014 LCDS. And, and no one else had uh, records going back to the mid 70s. So I was kind of like, yeah, that, that's what they called them. People, well, is it a crossing? And you'll know on the drawing on the right in 2014, had the temerity to put in, in a zigzags with it so it's got a control crossing that's a crossing it's got cycle only arms coming in both ways but i treated it as a crossing and i called it a crossing ah it's a crossing so by the time you get to to last year remember that um it's called this thing in the new ltn 120 a signal controlled cycle facility which i suppose is all right but it looks like a crossing smells like a crossing works like a crossing gets you across something for me, it's a crossing. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. I think people are confused about what that section means and what it's referring to. It's referring to crossings. Um, so yeah, this, this was kind of like the end piece of Laura's article. This, um, this thing that we officially got sanctioned from the Department for Transport to, to build in Stockport. It's very, very nearly finished. In fact, it might even be finished. I'm waiting for someone to tell me on Twitter. Um, so we've got like a, a parallel crossing there. We've got like an authorized use of zigzags. So that's why I've been saying, well, this is it. This is officially a crossing then. This thing that the Department for Transport were calling it crossing 25 years ago, we think it is a crossing now. Is it the first? Well, do we need a type of a new name for it. Uh, I suggested very silly things in the Laura article because everybody knows I'm flippant and I, and I quite like calling them elephant crossings for the elephant footprints that, that normally associate with them. Uh, shout out to, to Sam from uh, Manchester with Sparrow, which is which is much better and cooler than the kind of bird one. You know, signalised parallel could be good. Uh, alas, I'm not writing the national documents now, so I don't have the fun of naming everything. That was uh, that was the real joy about putting the LCDS together was uh, naming everything. Um, so anyway, back to the the law article. I'm going to show um, some examples. But I kind of came up with these really flippant kind of ways of calling them. Uh, this was uh, my favourite, the one that uh, I showed you back from 1974. A kind of double filter where you close uh, two arms of the crossroads and just have a cycling dedicated signal across like a mwah. there is no final way of crossing the road the only real downside with these and it is quite a downside is that you normally let go at the same time as pedestrians so you can't turn in and cut across them without another stop line and more paraphernalia but if getting across the barrier or the main road is your aim this is what we want people let's do more of them um the, the, this is when you start getting a little bit cheekier and I love these and, and some of the examples from 1984, it took me a while to figure out what the, how they worked. I was like, that's total genius because it's completely efficient. Nobody gets delayed. And in this case here, like uh, um, all vehicles have to do a left or, or they could go ahead and left. Cyclists can go straight ahead while all the vehicles are going to the left so they can shimmy over to the right hand side. I'll show you some examples of this in a minute. So cyclists are going one way, cars are forced to go another way. Lots of the best crossings in, in London use this. And then it's like, is it a crossing? Well, it kind of is a crossing, but it's also kind of a junction, but it gets you across on your own with no real conflict to, to worry about. So there's some, there's some beauties that get you across some of the worst gyratories. That's kind of why they make it into my uh, top 12. Um, yeah, the, the kind of cheeky one, uh, yeah, there's been a little bit of debate on this for Twitter today going, oh, I don't like that, oh, it should have been better and, and, and whatever. But like just having some kind of waiting space in the middle of the road, um, we're saying in the cycling planning world, left rights are a nightmare, right lefts are dead easy. So imagine if you're coming from a minor arm and you've got to do a right and then a left, 
then you're just running across to, to the other side of the road and then you've got an easy left off. Now, but if you're doing a left right, then you've got to somehow get yourself into the middle of the road with cars coming out of the side of you and try and get over to the right. It's the trickiest maneuver to make. So when we're planning routes, you're always trying to avoid these. I think this is a quite an elegant way of getting across them to just put a waiting area in the middle that's in this case is protected. And you're, some of you might recognize this, I'm sure. But I'm gonna go on a, on a tour now and, and uh, really show how badly I can do this kind of sharing. Let's do the Google tour. That wasn't too bad. Okay, and I'm gonna show them from this kind of angle so I can explain it and I'm, I'm hoping everybody can see my hand because uh, otherwise it's gonna be quite boring. This is the one from 1984 on Osselton Street. That's the British Library there. Um, just love this one. Everybody in Camden seems to be heading for this one. The way it works, if you're coming down from this road here, you come on the off side, all cars have to do a left. And then when this arm's going, cyclists can kind of just run across, get in the bus lane. And then if you're good, wait at that stop line. If you're not so good, creep through and jump into the track. It's a, it's a corky. You're getting across six lanes of traffic on Euston Road, which is an absolute nightmare. And you do it on the offside, all the cars are going that way. Thank you very much. It can sometimes be backed up there and you can kind of wiggle in there, but you know, you can tend to do it and it's quite a clever elegant way there's no time loss for anybody um obviously it's a super sensitive road being part of the inner ring road so a difficult one to just put a full closure on there but this gets you right across coming the other way it's in the top 12 but it's uh it's not as great you're coming from the minor on but there's two exit lanes and you kind of crawl across and then go off but it's one of those right lefts that are a lot easier you know to kind of cope with this, it gets you across six lanes. And I used to, when, when people used to visit me when I was running the London Cycle Network, I said, come with me, I'm gonna get you from Camden Town to Waterloo and you're not gonna see any cars. And they go, crazy, London's completely congested, but we'll be following this uh, this classic route through London, NCN6 now, quite way too. And you can just roll across the busy roads, not even realizing they're there and connect up all the, all the side roads. Brilliant. I better speed it up because there's 12 more of these. And I could talk about this one for the next hour. And I, if, I, if I finish this one and there's only three people left, I won't take it to heart. <laughs> okay, let's zoom around. Let's have a look at um, where this route goes. Should work. Science, go science. Wellington Street. It used to be the place in London that people studied pedestrian cycle conflicts. And I'll tell you for why. And I'll tell you how they sorted that out in Westminster because there's a real lesson for everybody here. Uh, now, coming this way, you're coming down through this kind of quiet street route through um, um, Covent Garden. You come up to the stop line, you get your lights. You have to run and then stop on that internal one, but at least this lot aren't coming at you. And at least this lot aren't coming at you when you do it. So it's actually quite pleasant. You just go and wait. Then you enter the cycle and you cross, cross Waterloo Bridge. Fantastic. No real drama there with the pedestrians. It used to be like um, almost kind of shared use a bit, really. It was kind of suggested where cyclists go, but it was very subtle. This is like a, the entrance to Theatre Land, Lion King's usually on there just to get people in the, in the mood. The, the issue was like coming this way. So there's huge amounts of cyclists in the morning coming off Waterloo Bridge. There's always that famous Toby Jacobs picture of this this being absolutely packed full of cyclists and they're all waiting and they all know that they're mixed with these cars so they better get a move on this is the main north south route through the whole of central London so you've got 50 60 cyclists all going right let's go get over there get over there before this lot captures so you've got 50 or 60 cyclists pouring onto the footway right outside theatre land where you've got like people with the maps shall we see the Lion King actually I've heard it's not that good you know all these kind of conversations are going on and then a, a mini peloton arrived there so it was always like a it, you could stand there and just see arguments every 15 to 20 seconds or at least every like cycle change but like what what Westminster did which is really important and which puts it right into the top category now is just make it clear that there's some kind of road for the exclusive use of cycle traffic going through there so people standing in the middle of this black tarmac go actually i think i'm on some kind of road here maybe i shouldn't stand there so it's it's there and it's working brilliantly and it's one of my favorites right Vauxhall bridge i mean look at this <laughs> 
I hope you're all as excited as I am. Now, there's there are issues, and being an engineer, I can't help but think of uh, some of the issues on this one. But just look how wide that parallel crossing is. It's just absolutely immense. And over this way, you've got a filter to filter through a tunnel of shape, but oh, it's it's this bit, and it gets more like a protected junction. This bit here, this crossing, is pretty spectacularly wide. You go straight across the poor old pedestrians, which is why it's not in the, you know, in the, in the top five. You know, I've got multi staggers to do to get across. You know, not particularly great, but he kept all these cars moving, and isn't that what we're all about in traffic engineering? But look at that, you can bolt straight across as a cyclist. Shame he gets a little bit shared here, but like this is like a. I remember one of the first saw this at TFL Malawa. This is like a, a spaghetti junction for cycling. This is a phenomenal. Will they get lane discipline for the work? But uh, it's it's still quite an awesome sight to, to ride across that junction if you like those kind of things. Of course you do, otherwise you would have left by now. And I, yeah, so I was gonna do ones outside of London. Um but, but I didn't in the end. So this is quite a bit London centric because London's got so many of them uh, that I could do my top one. There's some really good ones in Edinburgh, I have to say, and Greater Manchester. But, you know, these are my favourites um, from London. Uh, Stanhope Place, another classic. You can see the cars are coming out and they have to do a left. It's Bayswater Road, bloody awful road to cycle on and get across. There's, there's things being done, I know. So everybody goes there, but the cyclists can just bomb across into Hyde Park used to be until relatively recently the best way into Hyde Park no doubt about it coming the other way you just go parallel with the pedestrians you're into the the protected contraflow and you're off good to go just absolutely fantastic it changes people's lives when you've heard about that because you'd be wiggling around the maze that is Westminster then you come up with one of the best things. So there's a couple of real Westminster winners. You get a lot of grief, Westminster, but they've done some beautiful crossings in the past. And uh, I'm a big fan of this one, the Stanhope Place. So have a look at another one. Now, some of these might not look that pretty, but my God, they do a job. And the job in this instance is getting getting across Holborn Gyratory. I'll just go a little bit wider on this one. So that same route that we're working on um, way back in the day, the quiet route, British Museum up there, you're coming down, then you can turn left, get into a little bit of a contraflow, and then wait, you've got a signal stop line there, it just goes across with the pedestrians, gets you into the contraflow, gets you off towards like a Covent Garden, and gets you to avoid this horrific gyratory. Now sadly, when, when there was a development that happened and part of this was closed, we had a, a bunch of fatalities at a nearby junction, um, on, on Holborn because it's so awful the alternative route stuff being done now but uh works great and and I've got to say because this is a maximum cheeky rating I uh, really admire the the team that that put this together and uh, uh having to work with them in a quite a junior role at the time anyway everybody has to do a left because it's the gyratory but it's some kind of brilliant you arrive in a single lane there when the lights go all the cars go down here but you can just pop over into this bus lane there's a weird thing about this bus lane that I probably shouldn't say, <laughs> but yeah, there's no buses that go down there. So there's no cars that go down there either. It's just a non-functioning bus lane. So it's really, it's a big red cycle lane is the way I like to call about it. There's a, there's a interesting oddity. So you can just pop over, get yourself in that bus lane, you're off, um, you're back into that side street before anybody's even spotted you. You've got your signal control to do it. So it's practically protected the whole way just absolute brilliant crossing right in the heart of central London. Check that one out. Um, okay, let's have a look at the next one. I'll, I'll do these a bit quicker because well, I, mean, I want to really show you the top one. And I'm hoping you're enjoying looking at crossings <laughs> and it's not just me. You're down um, to 97 now. I know, Brian, I, I'm not going to take over from you, Brian, but you might want to just speed up a tiny bit. Speed up a bit. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. That's why it's here for when I get too much in there. All right, it's a similar principle. You can see cyclists can go this way. This is the one that I use for the design. Cars all have to do a left here. You get on the offside. You go when they go. You can run right across another six lanes of Swiss cottage. Oh, that is handy. And it avoids the horrific gyratory system that is Swiss cottage. Will we ever sort it out? I hope so. Here's Mayor Street. 
Mm. I know I should have done 10, Steve. I know, I know, but uh, I, I couldn't cut it down. This is the one we were talking about um, with the, the down face one. It would have been really difficult as a cyclist to come out and hang around in the middle here, turning off. But you can just wait. There's a bus lane. I know the visibility isn't fantastic. Just wait, jump into this. Then you just have a good, clear look all the way down the road. When it's clear, you just pop off. Coming the other way, you do exactly the same thing. Is it clear there? Thank you very much. Is it clear there? Lovely. And there are some pedestrian crossings in the, in the vicinity to kind of slow people down. Um, pretty good. Without that, we would have been looking at two extra signals on the main bus route um, through the centre of Hackney. Just bus, 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 bus. It would have been a huge delay and a total nightmare. By putting this in, we've got a cheeky crossing. There's, there's three or four others we could do along that corridor and hopefully uh, Hackney will let me do them one time. Okay, Royal College Street, I'll do this one super quickly because everybody's bored about me talking about Royal College Street. But I do quite like the uh, oh, the lesser spotted, splitted elephants. <laughs> so you can go this way now, but before the route went over here, so um, we had to get cyclists from here into this little filter here. And this did it quite nicely by telling people to go in a kind of unanticipated direction, which is the main use for elephants footprints really. It must be going in a, a slightly unintuitive way that's when you're supposed to use them for cyclists at signal junctions. This, I'm reliably informed by DFT, is the perfect use of that. From the other way, you're into the protection. All good. Got to talk about this one. We're getting into the hot ones now. Uh, yeah, Wolf and Forest, the kind of new kids on the block. Um, this crossing, been involved in a lot of these ones. And, and the issue was that we had segregation on Ruckholt Road on the approach before and after, but we had this pinchy bit, and look at all that parking, no one's gonna let us pull out that parking. So what do we do through the pinch bit if we can't get the segregation for cyclists? Let's just do it in time. So cyclists are kind of held here. Um, when the traffic's held here and that ped arm's going, cyclists just get a free run because there's no cars coming this way. These ones all go out to the right, so there's nothing coming there either. You just get to run all the way down here and jump back in the segregation, no harm, no foul, just by using the signals. For me, yeah, it's, it's a junction, but it's also like a crossing. It gets you through a pinch point, and it's an absolute peach of an idea, and I'd love to see more of those hit the streets. Well done, Wolven Forest. Couple more, Steve, couple more. Two minutes, Brian, minute. two minutes. Two minutes, two minutes. I'll, I'll finish quickly. All right, well, Colbrook Row gets you across the Angel Gyratory, uh, Boris's old house. I know he must love these crossings as he used this one every single day to get to City Hall, but it gets you across, filter either end, cars going one way, you go on the other, this like central waiting area for cyclists. To go. Just, just beautiful. At one stage, I was pretty convinced that everybody in North London was heading for this one crossing. Um, we built a few more now. Up the road, Holloway Road, just just a beautiful two-way one. Um, interesting that cars can go in here, but cyclists are in a two-way track. Oh, really not as good the aerial there and get you in by the side of a park. Nice, it cuts across. Could have been elephants. Does the job at all. Finished. And yes, and I have to finish this on a slightly different way because it shows the old alignment. That's how bad it is. That's how bad it is, but I'm going to... I've got to stop sharing and show you the greatest new one. Bear with me, Steve. Bear with me. Uh, oh, I thought I had it loaded up. Okay. Wait for it. Uh, the, the grand finale. So obviously, it's not working. Midland Road. So, so new, I have to go to the thing in there. But that's not working, is it? Oh, I'm going to, I'll tweet that out later because I've completely run out of the time for the evening. <laughs> and we I'll, missed number one, Brian. You missed number, oh, I've got to show you number one, haven't I? Let's stop sharing and, and try that again. Yeah, you've got to see number one. Let's just see, has that come up? Oh, yeah, it's there, it's there, okay. Wait for it, wait for it. Been a while, like I say. Uh, here. Yes, that would have bugged me if I hadn't got to show you. This is one of the one of the latest ones. Just 
just amazing. Uh, if, if I told you how how long I've been trying to get this crossing in here, you'd, you'd realise how old I truly am. But they, they kind of did it better than than my version as soon as I leave. It's always typical. By fully closing this road off, it used to be two-way traffic coming in there. There's our old friend Euston Road, six lanes of traffic. How'd you get across? No entry here except cyclists, your own little signals. Coming this way, it's an absolute dream. It splits, so it's a two-way. You cut into that side of the road, and you've got the track coming out this side. Coming the other way, so you're headed into what I think is one of the best cycle routes in London. And uh, coming the other way, yeah, you've got the lights. They're held. You've got to hold the left with the crossing. Beautiful. Gets you in there. And the uh, cycling this way, you just head over into the track there. So all fantastic. And they've got the fabled ped crossing in on this side, which is where the uh, the RNIB headquarters is just around the corner. And it always used to be a nightmare watching blind people trying to cross the road there. So just... Uh, I think that's the best crossing in the UK. And that's where we should leave that. So we've got no time for questions, which is good. Always do that on your own talks, Brian. Um, uh, we've got some really good people lined up for next week, I have to say. We'll be back and they'll be more efficient than I am, that's for sure. But uh, that's only been, but it's gonna be burning. I'm gonna pass over to Ruth to do the final words. Unless I've lost her by boring her crossing which is roof you still word. there yeah yeah final word so today i was on this absolutely extraordinary land or links all day event i thought i was only going to be there for two hours but i was there all day walking and cycling and it was phenomenal and hopefully brian will pick up on a couple of the people um seven thousand bikes been given to deprive people in birmingham amazing scheme and uh i did tell you about another one uh, love bike love Love riding, something like that. Anyway, Sam Robinson, fantastic. Um, but for my me, the greatest sadness was um, it finished with uh, a walking um, debate, which was fantastic. Lovely woman Emma from uh, Pathways was on, what have you. But they there still seems to be this thing between walking and cycling. And um, you know, as you all know, I'm a certain age and blah blah, and I can barely walk anymore. I never walk anywhere, I cycle everywhere. So, this month already in the bad weather, I've done 350 miles, and that includes leaving my house, just going to the shops, whatever. And I think, in terms of disability, there is age disability, um, chronic feet pain, knee pain, shoulder pain, so you can't carry shopping. All these can be resolved with a bicycle. Um, and it, as long as it's the right bicycle and that's why image is so important about how we represent cycling and walking and last thing again is please don't talk about I'm a walker or I'm a cyclist we walk and we cycle and that's my last word apart from Steve's gorgeous 60s retro jumper <laughs>